Okay, so we have a lot to cover in very little time. Let's get to it. We are looking at Macbeth concepts and quotes, and we are going to try and do it in under 10 minutes. So what we're going to be looking at is ambition, social order, nature, loyalty, deception, gender, violence, guilt, and supernatural. Firstly, ambition. Let's start with the most obvious concept. The reason ambition is so integral to the understanding of the play of Macbeth is because it is Macbeth's fatal flaw, his ambition. All tragic figures in Shakespeare possess hematia, and it is this that is the cause of their downfall. What is so unique about Macbeth's ambition is that he cannot rationalize it. He doesn't know why he is ambitious other than for ambition's sake alone. He confesses that he has only vaulting ambition, which overleaps itself and falls on the other. And I think this is most potently illustrated by the fact that Macbeth does nothing with his power. Once he becomes king, he is beset with paranoia and insecurity and uses his army to kill anyone who opposes him. As such, what characterizes Macbeth's ambition is his sense of powerlessness to it. The witch's prophecy, his wife, the floating dagger, the bell, all tell Macbeth to do it, and he cannot stem the control that they have over him. Macbeth is often controlled by external factors, and he is often described as being in a daze, which I think is part of his disassociation. Secondly, we have social order. Now, social order is not just about hierarchy, it is also about balance. The divine rule of kings ensured that order within society and that there is a balance between good and evil. King Duncan appoints Malcolm as his heir as Prince of Cumberland, and Macbeth immediately per perceives this as a step on which he must fall down or else overleap, for in his way it lies. Again, we see this imagery here of overleaping um, and this sort of momentum driving Macbeth forward. And again, it's this feeling of being out of control. As the law, King Duncan has determined that no other will rule after him except his son. And Macbeth must act or never be king. And it is for this reason that he decides he will corrupt the social order in order to gain what he wants. The concept of nature is inextricably linked with order. Nature represents the externalization of order and is directly affected by events. Nature acts as both a concept and a motif which encapsulates the examples of the strange natural, natural occurrences that happen during the play. After King Duncan is murdered, they talk about how the earth was feverish and did shake and that Duncan's horses did eat each other, which apart from being creepy is also uh, indicative of the disruption that has happened in nature. So chaos in the social hierarchy means that there is also chaos in nature. The idea of loyalty is an integral aspect of the thanes servitude to their king all of the thanes pledge an allegiance to their king at their coronation which is why it is so telling that macduff does not attend macbeth's coronation not only that but we have the idea of kingship um, and that is so pervasive in macbeth duncan is both macbeth's king his divinely appointed ruler and his kinsman they are of the same kin, meaning bloodline. 
So King Duncan refers to Macbeth as his cousin and Macbeth states that Duncan is here in double trust. First as I am his kinsman and his subject. It is this relationship which allows King Duncan to be absolutely deceived again uh, by placing his absolute trust in his kinsmen, even though he knows there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth work hard to mask their agenda from the outset. Lady Macbeth instructs Macbeth to look the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. This line is loaded with imagery and binary, whereby what is on the outside is no indication of what is on the inside. Macbeth echoes this to Lady Macbeth as well when he says, false face doth hide what the false heart must know. In order to execute the murder of the king, they have to appear innocent and trustworthy. In contrast to the divinely sanctioned rule of the king, it is important to note that the witches operate outside the natural order. They are part of the supernatural, and anything supernatural was considered to be part of the devil and associated with the devil. So as rightly observed by Banquo, the witches are in fact instruments of darkness. What fascinates me the most though regarding the witches is their singular interest in Macbeth. They agree to meet on the heath to meet Macbeth. Before they enter the scene for the first time, they chant, a drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. It is his mortal soul that they are focused upon, which I think is a strong indication of his inherent wickedness. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. And as they say, it takes one to know one. When looking at the concept of gender, we have to remember that this includes representations of masculinity and femininity. They are equally important in considering the concept of gender. So masculinity is tied with patriarchal social structure and protection of the kingdom and the domestic realms as well. So numerous references are made to traditional notions of bravery and being valiant um, and also to um, acts of violence as well, being inherently masculine as well. Lady Macbeth, on the other hand, fulfills negative female stereotypes. She is scheming, manipulative and ruthless and very much like the witches in her commands to murdering ministers to be filled with direst cruelty. That is no coincidence. As the only female character for much of the play, we don't get a clear understanding of ideal femininity until we are introduced to Lady Macduff, who is then promptly killed. But not before revealing to us that she is critical of Macduff, her husband, for having to leave his wife, to leave his babes, from whence he doth fly. The use of a bird motif in her conversation with her son paints a vulnerable and maternal image of her who is left to fend her nest. And again, this is a very stark in contrast with Lady Macbeth, who declares that she would have dashed the brains out of her newborn babe. With the world of Macbeth, it is steeped in violence. From the outset of the play, it is set against a backdrop uh, of war. Uh, you know, Scotland is at war with the Norwegians. And in that opening scene, the audience is greeted with bloodied soldiers who are unrecognizable. They are that covered in blood. 
Uh, they then go on to describe the winds of their victory, which includes a brutal account of how Macbeth had unseemed a man from the nave to the chops, meaning that they sliced him open from his stomach to his head. Um, and then ended it all with a nice staking of his head on the battlements. So it's pretty gruesome stuff, really. Um, what is important is that these battles, though, are fought in the context of honour. They are being fought to protect uh, and in honour of the king, King Duncan. Um, now, this is obviously completely different to... The battles then that Macbeth wages when he himself is king, which is part of his reign of tyranny on the kingdom. And it is noted that, you know, much of the soldiers who fight for him have been paid. They are a mercenary army. They do not fight for him out of honour or servitude. Now, it all comes full circle in the end with both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth succumbing to their guilt-stricken consciences. Turns out you can't just kill a king, commit treason, murder your best friend and sacrifice your mortal soul and sleep soundly at night. It's one of the aspects of Macbeth's character that defines his remaining sense of humanity until he doesn't anymore. Um, Macbeth's lines, Macbeth doth murder sleep, and Lady Macbeth's sleepwalking tie into this motif of sleep. Not only is sleep a fundamental part of the nature of their guilt, but it is a part of their human nature that has been taken away from them, that they no longer possess. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth indeed shall sleep no more. But you get it. You stay till the end. Here's some extra magic for you. The concept of fate versus free will is one that appears in most Shakespearean tragedies. It raises the question of whether the tragic hero, in this case Macbeth, is the victim of a predestiny or his own actions. And I guess it really does come down to what you believe in. Do you believe in predestination? that our lives are already predetermined course of events? Or do you believe that we are the ultimate arbiters of our fates? Either way, I think that what you believe directly impacts your assessment of Macbeth. There is a case to be made for both sides. There is evidence that corroborates the idea that Macbeth is a victim of fate um, and can be assigned to the interference of the three witches. Their delivery of the prophecy seems to set in motion the tragic events of the play. They are plotting on the blasted heath to meet Macbeth. They deliver deliberately ambiguous statements. Yet there is also evidence that illustrates his treacherous nature. Immediately after the prophecy, he confesses, my murder, who's yet but fantastical. Why is he thinking about murder already, so soon, unless he's already thought of murdering King Duncan before? So this also lends itself to how Lady Macbeth makes that same immediate leap to killing the king upon reading Macbeth's letter. It seems the Macbeths have been thinking about regicide for quite some time. <laughs> 